Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. My name is Serena Longo, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, I'm so pleased to introduce this virtual event with Peter Pesek presenting his new book, Sounding Bodies, joined in conversation by Logan McCarty. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. Tonight's event is the latest installment in our Harvard Science Book Talk series, which works to bring the authors of recently published science literature to our Cambridge community and beyond. To learn more about our series and, of course, our other upcoming events, you can visit harvard.com, sign up for our email newsletter, or check out the page harvard.com science for more info. I'll also be posting a link to the Science Research public lectures channel in the chat where you can view previous talks that you might have missed. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we'll get to as many as time allows. Very shortly in the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase Sounding Bodies on harvard.com. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and of course, help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Thank you to our partners at Harvard University and thank you all for showing up and tuning in in support of authors, publishers, indie book selling, and of course, science. And now it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. Peter Pesek's seven books consider questions in the history and philosophy of science, music, and ideas. He's an associate of the Department of Physics at Harvard University and has been on the faculty of St. John's College in Santa Fe since 1980, where he's been deeply involved in shaping its unique program of science, of study in laboratory science, mathematics, and music. He is also director of its Science Institute, which offers week-long intensive seminars on important texts in science and mathematics. Tonight, he'll be joined in conversation by Logan McCarty, Assistant Dean of Science, Undergraduate Education, Lecturer on Chemistry and Chemical Biology, and Lecturer on Physics at Harvard University. This evening, they've joined us for a discussion of Peter's new book, Sounding Bodies, Music and the Making of Biomedical Science, which traces the unfolding influence of music and sound on the fundamental structure of the biomedical sciences. Jacqueline Duffin of Queens University writes, Pesek's erudite and sweeping composition will delight lovers of music, medicine, and mathematics with myriad and enduring ways that sound and the body have generated analogies for each other. We've got a lot to learn this evening, so without further ado, I'm delighted to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is all yours, Peter. Thank you so much, Serena, for that really Thank nice you. introduction and for the opportunity to, to appear here. Thanks especially to Melissa Franklin, who has so kindly invited me and, and sponsored me at Harvard, been such a great help, and to, to Logan, who is going to join me shortly. For me, this is a very special moment to be able to share with you this new book, um, Sounding Bodies. It is, for me, a kind of culmination of uh, a lifelong interest in music and science, um, which I've been trying to find out the relationship between these two, and have produced now three books, of which this is the third, of a kind of family. They're not really a trilogy because they each stand on their own and have separate themes, but they are siblings, I think, as you will see. The first, Music and the Making of Modern Science, published by MIT Press in 2014, argued that in fact, that music was one of the shaping forces that uh, affected the physical and mathematical sciences um, in a way that I'll speak about more in a moment. Polyphonic Minds, published in 2017, took the argument further to examine the particular importance of polyphony, music of many voices, especially in relationship to the neuroscience, to the sciences of the mind, and to the human sciences. This last book in the family, uh, Sounding Bodies, Music in the Making of Biomedical Science, is concerned with a question that came up with one of my teachers at Harvard to whom the book is dedicated, Gerald Holton, who asked me after a talk, uh, kind of playfully, so why is it that uh, biologists don't care as much about music as physicists do? Of course, he was being playful. You couldn't really decide whether that was true. There's so many, um, 
uh, life scientists, physicians especially, that are deeply musical, you couldn't really begin to compare whether that's really true. But his playful question was, uh, uh, spurred me to ask, did music have a, a different or, or any effect on the, on the biological and medical sciences or that could be compared to the kind of argument that I was making about what they did to the physical sciences. In the case of the physical sciences, uh, the Pythagoreans in ancient Greece began the connection between music and the physical world, and which was taken up by Plato and others and installed as the quadrivium, the heart of the liberal arts, which changed human life and the university into basically what we is today, in which music and its sisters, arithmetic, geometry, and astronomy, these four sisters were the parents, as it were, of the modern physical and mathematical sciences. In the case of the biological medical sciences, they stood apart. Medicine was not part of the ancient quadrivium, but it was in fact a kind of Pythagorean project. Pythagoras and his disciples went about to heal as much as they did to teach. I mean, they had a tremendous influence um, uh, because of that. In the book, I try to argue that biology and medicine came under the influence of Pythagorean ideas almost from the earliest days, so that one could say that Western medicine was another child of the Pythagoreans, a child that came to know its siblings, the physical and mathematical sciences. Um, the, this developed over time, and the hero of this was a man named Herophilus of Chalcedon, a third century Alexandrian physician, not very well known, even though that Vesalius called him the prince of anatomists. He began to apply the ratios of the pulse to um, ratios, musical ratios to the pulse, which fascinated Galen and then spread throughout Western medicine via the Arabs and medieval writers. The earliest links developed between music, mathematics, and medicine as arithmetic was applied to the pulse and to also to the timing of crises and disease. Beginning about 1700, new ideas, tools, and techniques gradually transformed medicine and biology by seeking physical and me uh, mechanical explanations. Among these was an important sonic turn in these fields, by which I mean the use of sound to give new insights and intervention into living organisms. The ancient pursuit of Pythagorean ratios felt in the pulse ultimately led to new practices of listening to the body involved in what I've called sonic and rhythmic knowledge. By comparison with the physical sciences, this sonic turn came later and had a different form and dynamic. It was not a single event, but comprised many successive waves. Sound offered a way to understand the hidden workings of living bodies that was not available even to the trained medical gaze or to observational biology based only on visible evidence. This sonic turn led to the development of such techniques as mediate auscultation, the stethoscope, and ultrasound, which became essential tools of biomedical science. This turn towards sound also affected the superstructure of concepts the life sciences used to understand the bodies they were sounding. So my book is really not so much about musical therapy, about which others have written very well, but about the way in which music formed a kind of template for the fundamental structure of, of biology and medicine. Most important, the ancient concept of living bodies as composed of humors, liquids essentially, came way, gave way to a new concept in which those bodies were essentially formed by ses sensitive, resonant, and vibrating fibers, particularly understandable by their relationship to sound. In a kind of large overview, if music affected the physical sciences primarily through pitch or melody, it affected the biomedical sciences more through rhythm. And so with that kind of grand overview with it, I'd like to uh, invite Loga to join in and begin our conversation. Thanks, Peter. Um, uh, thanks for that overview. So I think, um, let me start with a question going back to, um, actually going back to the ancient Greeks. And it's clear reading your, your history of the, um, the Pythagoreans and then of Herophilus that, you know, they were really very confused about, from our modern standpoint, really very confused about a lot of things of the connection between, you know, the physical sciences, the body, music, um, mathematics, all of these things. They had some things right, you know, the music and mathematics connections of the Pythagoreans were, were correct. But then I think later of your, you know, discussion in the, in the, um, 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, also some very confused 
perspectives on the connection between the body and music and all those things. And I guess a question for me is, did, did music lead to sort of wrong turns? I'm sure you could think of some examples, sort of wrong turns in the development of an understanding of biology and medicine. Mm. And, and can you contrast those with maybe some of the places where it's, it created seeds that led to you know, fruitful ideas? Um, uh, maybe give us some of, maybe some examples of both of those. Um, yeah, it's a very interesting question because certainly much of that early understanding was wrong. As the idea, for instance, that Herophilus had that he could feel, not here because people weren't hearing the pulse, they could feel in the pulse ratios like three to two between the systole and the diastole. And Galen, who took up the idea and really put it on the map, said that he thought he could feel ratios like seven to two, things that don't figure in the consonant musical ratios that people know from, you know, you'd think of their dissonant intervals. I, to me, it seemed as, as if what was important about it was not so much whether it was right or wrong, but it began a kind of conversation or continued a kind of conversation about the, the relationship of medical science and biology to numbers and to the physical sciences that was in its large thrust so deeply productive that it's it, that all of its mistakes were great mistakes, <laughs> even if what it was totally barking up the wrong tree. So Rothfeld's idea in a certain sense is crazy. It's not that, that you, pulse ratios like three to two really matter diagnostically, but it, they mattered infinitely in the sense that people started to play very close attention to the pulse. And the idea that there may be something musical going on led someone like Marquet, this French physician in the 18th century, to try to write down the heart's sound, you know, the sound of the pulse in terms right. of musical notation. And that in turn led other people to say like, well, maybe we can hear this music. And that led to the stethoscope. At that point, then people were like, like, whoa, there's not three to two here. They're hearing things that sound like, I don't know what, electronic music or something like that. Hisses and whooshes and bellows sounds and all kinds of sound that have nothing to do with musical pitches as are usually understood. But the path to that was led up to by sort of brilliant mistakes, whose brilliance was all in support of, of what I would like to emphasize as a really super fundamental idea, which was that Western medicine, beginning with the Pythagoreans and, and the Greeks, was a rational medicine. The gods were not involved. Even right. So that, I mean, you, yeah, you, sorry to interrupt that. You, you made that point early on, which I thought was, was you know, a, a claim that at least in the at the context of the time, Pythagoras was the first to suggest that, you know, things like illness weren't just the arbitrary, capricious, you know, workings of a god and instead had something to do with physical, mathematical um, uh, world, what we might call a mechanical understanding of, yes. of medicine and the body. And that certainly was a was a somewhat revolutionary and, uh, and obviously productive um, um, view. I love so you you. You brought up Marquet. I think Marquet is a fascinating figure who you've dug up from history. How did you, I'm curious, how did you stumble across some of these characters that you, that you describe in this book? I just think, wow, what, you know, what led you to this figure? And Marquet actually plays a pretty prominent role in one of your chapters. I don't know if you have an image of one of his musical, musical scores setting, describing the heart, sure, heart rhythms. Nice. Yeah, right um, so for here. our for our uh, our audience here, Marquet took these um, rhythms, and it should, and just to be clear, he wasn't actually listening to the heart, right? He was just taking the pulse that that he felt, correct? Yes, that's right. But he was that's using right. elaborate musical notation to describe the the feeling of the pulse, um, and really sort of florid um, uh, musical notation that. Clearly, it's fantastic, right? No, no actual pulse would follow a, a musical no shades like he had, but he had these incredible. I might almost call it a vision. Right, and the, the, you have the, the tune. The, the, I, can't, I can't get my PowerPoint to behave here to show it to you, but he basically writes a little dance jig. Um, and that's uh, and that becomes the way in which he explains the pulse and the, 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 the each measure corresponds to one pulse beat. And he has other pages in which he writes out 
the, the, what the note, notation would be for various kinds of pulse that are, are um, convulsive or other categories of pulse that go back even to Galen, who is following Herophilus, trying to say like, well, something's going on in the pulse and let's try to describe it in words. And so Marquet wrote musical notation, but it's very clear that the musical notation, and I'll try to explain this in the book, has a lot to do with the music that he knew with uh -huh. French, French operatic music of the time. And so in that sense, I mean, it's certainly clear that the, the heart is not playing, I don't know what, French dance music of the 18th <laughs> century or, or overtures from Rameau's operas, like the examples that I give. But even though all of those examples are limited by the by the frame of reference that, that he approached them with, in a way that still is something that's very, very important because all was, as Thoreau said, all human understanding happens through analogy. And analogy begins with things that we know. And if, and, and, and if it's going to be a sonic understanding, it has to begin with the music and the sounds that people know. But the fact that that was being pressed in service to try to express this vision of a rational medicine in which it was possible to know things, as you said, by relationship to the physical and mathematical sciences, so that there was always a tie back to number, to mechanical explanations. Um, those, those deep undercurrents that go back all the way, I think, back to Pythagoras, ultimately, uh, were so productive and so important and also so perplexing because people could see that they didn't work out. The Arabs, the medieval people kept puzzling out of Galen right. himself. Everybody realized that it wasn't right, <laughs> but right. people realized that there was something to it. And that, of course, is the great, the great thing because the most ideas when they're first born are probably mostly wrong or at least in, partly wrong. And in a sense, yeah. yeah, in a sense, um, Galen and Herophilus and Marquet, they were sort of asking the right questions, just getting the wrong answers. They were, <laughs> they were thinking, oh, I should be able to learn something by paying attention to the pulse. And of course, later on, with the invention of the stethoscope, we know that by hearing the heart, you actually can learn a lot. Um, maybe tell us a little bit about the discovery and invention of the stethoscope. How did that process take take place and how was that influenced by this musical understanding of the pulse well this musical understanding i think grew through the 18th century as as medical practitioners began to go from feeling the pulse to realizing that there might be something that you could actually hear and this represents a kind of a long shift that happens over it really happened over the 2000 years between the that the pythagoreans thought that somehow numbers governed phenomena in a kind of immaterial way that they were archetypes as for divine archetypes that somehow informed the cosmos and also the microcosm the human being um, it took a long time before people started to say like, wait a minute, they're also vibrating bodies and these vibrating bodies are mechanical things and the mechanical things have a kind of understandability. The numbers that are in mechanical things are understandable, not because they're divine archetypes, but because you can kind of show how vibrating strings naturally give rise to numbers as their overtones. The moment that started to happen already in the 17th century, more and more people realized that they had to listen to things. So uh, someone like Leopold Allenbrugger, who is a physician who is deeply steeped in music, whose daughter was a famous composer and, and, and pianist, and he himself wrote libretti for Salieri, he started to tap on the body and treat it as a musical instrument by percussion. And that's still done by physicians like all the time, in practically every medical visit, because it's such a quick way of revealing the, the status of the especially fluid in the body and its, mm -hmm. its locations and, and presence. So that, I think, really began it. Then the moment people realized that the, mu that the body was a passive musical instrument, it was not a very far thought to think, well, maybe it's actually producing sounds on its own, because even a few physicians even noticed they, they would put their ear close to a patient's body, chest or something, and they would hear things. Um, that which was called immediate uh, auscultation. Auscultation, the word that Lenek invented to, to describe a kind of very attentive therapeutic uh, hearing. So it, then when Lenek decided that he could amplify the sound and hear it more clearly through a cylinder, a kind of stethoscope, then suddenly he the, 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 that opened the portal. And for Lenek, it had to do a lot that he was extremely interested in music. He was a devotee of Breton music. And um, 
he uh, very interested in the Breton language and in musical culture. And in the book, I discuss how he actually heard songs, music coming out of some of his patients, which when you look at the notation, he would write it down in musical notation. If you play it, it sounds a lot like Breton folk music. And I give an example of that in the book, which is very, which is very curious. I mean, the other thing that's important about Lenek is that he himself was suffering from the disease that was affecting most of his patients, which was not recognized as a disease. It was considered nostalgia, homesickness, uh, right. but a clinical kind of homesickness. It was called the nostalgie de Bayou because a friend of his had it. In fact, it was tuberculosis. But in the process of trying to listen, Lenek, who is himself suffering from this disease, was trying to find out that it was a disease he was suffering from and hmm. not sadness, a mortal sadness of being separated from Brittany where he'd grown up. And it's the relationship between the symptom, homesickness, and the cause tuberculosis was only gradually being unpacked and listening was a crucial way in which it in which it happened. Without Lonek's extraordinary ability to listen and to try to understand sounds that made no sense musically, that sounded like bellows or a little bell right. or funny rattlings. His terms like haral is still a term that physicians use all the time when they talk about the, the 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 sounds made by fluid compromised lungs. So I mean, there um, his musical background was a, a kind of crucial factor in the development of the stethoscope. Right. So if uh, so now to move to maybe jump to actually almost the end of the book, where you talk about sort of contemporary understanding of of sound. One of the things that's remarkable about the stethoscope and medical training is how how physicians have to be trained to listen to these tiny little subtle differences between different kinds of sounds. So when you, you mentioned um, that um, these heart murmurs, which are often caused by turbulence in the heart. Um, so for instance, my daughter, when she was young, the, uh, the pediatrician said, oh, you know, I hear a heart murmur, but I wanna have a specialist yeah. look at this. And all the specialists did was use a stethoscope to listen. But of course, the specialist had such experience with listening to these kinds of murmurs. The specialist said, oh, you know, this is probably the kind of thing that she'll grow out of and it'll go away. But it was fascinating that, in a sense, the difference between the pediatrician and the specialist was their, their sensitivity in hearing and that training and sort of grounding in really listening carefully to this, um, to this sound. And you talk about that. So this is a segue, maybe an inelegant segue, um, to talking about um, uh, scientists studying the nerves and trying to understand nervous impulses and actually using sound as a way of, of hearing what's going on in the nerves. Maybe tell us a little bit about that. And actually, if you want to say something about the stethoscope <laughs> and, oh. and that only, only to add as a kind of footnote that the stethoscope, which there's a whole genre of medical literature deploring the fact that now doctors don't learn how to listen like that. Yeah. Even the specialists, because they will go immediately to echocardiograms or yeah. which again yeah. is a kind of another ultrasonic um, modality. But but in fact, now there are digital stethoscopes which can you know, then you can take the data and you can examine it in another way. So the stethoscope has obtained a kind of new life. And these are very useful in in, in, in poor countries where there are few physicians, few advanced care centers. You can use this. Uh, you could take a digital image of the sound and send it via your iPhone to a distant center. So the stethoscope continues to live, even though it's been pronounced dead sort of recently. <laughs> yeah. To go back to the story of nerves, to me, that was one of the most fascinating stories um, in the book, because I had one of the ways in which the book started, because I had heard that uh, David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel at, at, at Harvard, who when they made their discovery of the uh, the, how the visual cortex function used hearing to do that. And that startled me and was a large part of what sort of set me on the trace to figure out like, this, where did that start and who invented that? And I mean, I discovered that in fact, it's now used all over the world. Uh, every electrophysiology lab that, that does neuroscience will be using audio, audio monitoring to actually hear the nerves. 
And the story, it turns out, goes back to Edgar Adrian, the British uh, physiologist, a very famous physiologist, who in the 20s was the person who finally established the doctrine that ner nerves fire in an all or nothing fashion. And to establish I... this, he had to locate a single a single neuron, which is already a kind of tour de force, because you're trying to probe, you can't do it visually because you're trying, you need it to be living tissue. And so the only way to do it was to put a very, very fine needle in there and then to listen to what you were hearing. And in the book, I give sound examples of what that listening is like. And neuro, uh, neuroscientists like Leslie Kay and then Bevel Conway at the National Eye Institute were very, very kind in sharing their recollections of what it is. Uh, Bevel told me that, that each neuron has its own voice, which I thought was startling that, that a, you know, a person that's going through the brain with electrode will say, oh, there's this one, there's that one. We'll, we'll get to know the personalities, the sound of each of those neurons. Right, um, and, as the, uh, and as an expert, in a sense, they they use this to identify. Oh yes, now I'm right. Now I'm really getting a good signal from this one exactly. neuron as I'm moving this fiber back and forth. And, and it really is a testament body. to you know the human's ability to hear and to hear subtle variations in sound. And of course, with neurons, since the intensity of the stimulus is usually reflected in the in the frequency of the um, firing of the neuron, yes. Yes. right? So you can. And of course, we're very sensitive to hearing that kind of frequency and, and detecting small changes in those um, in those patterns. It's almost better than having a visual readout is one of the lessons I think that you that you say, that you say in your book yeah, that, for some of these phenomena. You find the neurons by sound. You hear as you approach right. one. What you, your description was exactly right, and that's what uh, that's what Adrian realized. That's how he did his discovery. That he had one of his one of his students uh, said, "Well, why don't you try using a loudspeaker?" And people had started using telephones on the nerves in the 1890s. For instance, you can sing into a telephone that's attached to a frog nerve, and you can see an image of the frog's nerve firing off at the at the frequency of C. So it was clear this kind of connection was important, but the use of the loudspeaker was crucial, for instance, for Hubel and Wiesel, because what they would be doing is they'd be showing an anesthetized cat various kinds of images, and they had to be manipulating the image, and the cat's reaction was entirely transmitted to them by sound. And so there's a video that I show in, in, that include in the book in which you can see they're recounting or showing how they made their discovery. And it was, they, they were getting nowhere. They couldn't get anything. And finally, they just moved, one day they moved a slide just a little bit in the, in the, in the projector. And all of a sudden, Jubal said the, the cat's neurons went off like a machine gun. And they suddenly realized, like, and they did it again. And at first they thought it was what the cat was looking at, which would happen to be a spot on the slide. But it, they got rid of that and they realized it was only just the edge of the slide. And this was the discovery for which they won the Nobel Prize. And right. rightly so, as, as Adrian did win the Nobel Prize for this discovery made by sound. In fact, at his Nobel lecture, he even played a gramophone record of the sound of the nerves, which I tried really hard to find, but it shows you sound gets lost and nowhere in the Nobel archives and nowhere, in, I mean, I tried everything. No one can find this record, this gramophone record, which I think would be so interesting to hear because for him, and then he also tells a wonderful story once that it happened in the forties, much, much later. And he had a toad, uh, the, the, he was looking, he had connected the retina of a toad to a loudspeaker and the room was dimly lit and he was doing things and he heard the, it going off and he realized, he said, well, wait a second, what? it's dark in here, what is he seeing? And he realized that he was hearing the toad seeing him. And the thing that's amazing about this to me is that the nervous system of the toad and our nervous system seem to operate by the same code. That is to say, as you, it's a, it ha, it's frequencies, which means rhythms, right. because the frequencies involved are below uh, below the threshold at which human the human ear will per perceive a, a a regular pulsation as a pitch, which is about 20, 30 cycles a second, it tends to be more like eight, ten, something like that. So it sounds like ta -ta 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 -ta. so when you approach a nerve that's firing a single nerve, yeah. and yeah. when you when you hear a lot of them, it just sounds like a lot of like a lot of popcorn going off. But to me, it seemed it seemed really, really interesting and important that sound would be such an important would have led to two such really crucial discoveries in modern neuroscience.
So um, your, the title of your book is about music and the making of biomedical science, but the, there's a lot of, you know, it's interesting, um, and maybe there's not a clear uh, line that I should draw between influence that's related to music specifically, as we would conceive music, versus just sound in general. And I wonder, you know, it, and of course, with with contemporary music, you know, there are composers who create music out of all kinds of different sound, right? Sound is now the, the um, we can think much more broadly, but, um, you know, I wonder, you know, how much of your book is really about music conceived in a more traditional sense versus, you know, applications of sound in um, biomedicine? Well, in a certain sense, relatively little, because as you say, sound liberate sound liberated from musical pitch in its traditional understanding became yeah. far, far more important uh, than sound with its traditional pitches. Although quite a bit of my book tries to deal with um, ways in which just music, music, even classical and romantic music, became important as templates for uh, innovative and even questionable modes of therapy, like mesmerism in particular. Yeah. Um, part of my book is a description of a symphony, which is the first kind of description, in, in, not a description in prose, but a description of music of obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, and so a musical picture of this, and the musical picture is very, very clear uh, in the symphony by Brunetti that I talk about. And it's a, it's, it's a picture that resonated within the Spanish royal court where he was a physician and in which for 50 years, the, the, the king of Spain had been floridly, successive kings of Spain had been floridly, had been... floridly mentally disturbed in one way or yeah. another, certainly uh, obsessive compulsive um, to the highest degree. So it, there, there are a lot of passages in the book that even talk about music traditionally, but it seems to me that as in the history of music that you were just alluding to a moment ago, music in the sense of musical pitches, um, the kind of repeatable things that are like the sounds of instruments, of musical instruments, strings or pianos, gradually, even within music itself, gave way to this much broader sound world. Um, and in the book, I tell the story of how Mesmer used the glass harmonica, which produces these penetrating, eerie kind of high frequency sounds to evoke mesmeric crises, to alter the course of crises, which traditional medicine up until his own time had thought were unalterable facets of disease. He was right. able to induce or delay crises through music specifically. And then his successor, Charcot in particular, Charcot, the teacher of Freud, used a tam-tam, a big kind of pitchless gong, and was able to induce a kind of hypnotic states, some of them maybe even simulated or faked, but states at any rate that were owed something to a sound source that was no longer a sound source of certain pitches, but of a kind of broad kind of um, uh, broad uh, spectrum of harmonics all across the frequency spectrum that then would have a very different effect would render the patients cataleptic they wouldn't be then go into a crisis uh, as mesmer did which would be usually a kind of a violent affair a kind of convulsive sort of seizure instead they would go into a catatonic cataleptic state which would be highly suggestible and which became the preferred mode of operation for hypnotists certainly for charcot and maybe even to the present day, I don't think, I don't really know, but I, I imagine people don't go in much for inducing crises in their patients anymore. But I mean, it, it, it did seem like at the end of that chapter, you suggested that the, that the role of music in all of this, and the, for instance, even the role of the tam-tam or the glass harmonica, you know, was really unclear, right? After all, you know, today hypnotists use other kinds of devices and suggestion to create these hypnotic states. And, you know, it's it, it's fascinating that just at a time when, for instance, the glass harmonica had been just recently introduced and was sort of all the rage, you have a, a description of it being used in Donizetti's opera, um, or when the tam-tam had just been introduced, these became sort of, you know, suggestive parts of popular culture. And then that's what the hypnotists decided to use. You know, that's what Mesmer used. Um, you know, so the, the connection with music there is an interesting one. It's sort of the music slash cultural milieu that is really the 
issue, it seems. And I think it all, a lot of it has to do, as, you, as your question presses me to, to say, with the importance of the modality of hearing, whether it's musical sounds or non, <laughs> what we'd call non-musical sounds, as a modality of understanding the world. And music somehow pressed people in that direction first because it somehow said, this, the things that you hear have a kind of intelligibility and order and coherence, which is very particular to them. It has a very profound effect on human hearers and, and, and on their mind. And it also represents a mode of knowing that was in general historically undervalued. Um, Aristotle privileged sight as the, 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 the great vision, you know, that that was, the, that was the sense by which people really, really knew. That was the primary sense and hearing any other senses were then relegated to a secondary, uh, a secondary role. But just because the inside of the body was opaque to, to, to sight, certainly while it was functioning, uh, while it was alive, only hearing, only hearing would provide some kind of a portal into the invisible realm that was absolutely crucial for understanding what was happening in living organisms. So in that sense, it's maybe music also becomes a proxy for hearing as a whole and for the the kind of knowledge that is medi mediated by by hearing which is very different from visual so in my book i try to talk about the kinds of knowledge of sonic knowledge for instance the knowledge that you have to have the physician the specialist that was able to listen to your daughter and say like no i don't think I can see why the person has brought her in, but this is this is slightly different. And you hear that, you hear that, you hear that. Um, and then that developed even further into a rhythmic knowledge so that Adrian was not merely hearing. It was not merely the sounds, but it was the sense right, of the rhythm. Yeah. You were listening to the rhythms and rhythms convey something different than, than sounds just heard as a kind of purely sonorous phenomenon because also hearing and music and it is closer to time. It's able to communicate what's happening in time far better than any kind of visual display. Even through the time of Hubel and Wiesel, um, oscilloscopes couldn't be photographed. The visual image that you could form through, you know, quite highly developed electronic instruments was too transient. And the visual cathode ray image was not stable enough to be photographed so that really the only tool you had for working in real time was sound. And uh, so that in that sense, sound was also revealing something about the time behavior of organism, which has got to be crucial to life. It's is not a static phenomenon, which no single image, maybe uh, no data point, <laughs> right. no graph, you know, even stepping away from sort of visual imagery, um, computer images, they all lose the sense of time. They all lose the sense of something is happening critical moment and you can hear it and this because fundamentally because the brain as as Nietzsche said is the organ of fear it is plugged right there into the, the ear is plugged to the bottom of it in anything like the complex way that that um, the visual images are and you can hear just immediately what's going on at the right. end of the book I talk about now uh, the sort of ways of sonifying brain waves that are used uh, to di diagnose silent seizures. And if mm -hmm. you sonify the normal brain, which sort of sounds like a kind of white noise, and then if you sonify a silent seizure, it sounds like uh, 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 something like that. And you, the, the, the difference leaps out at you and you don't have to look if, you know, if you try to look at it, images, uh, images of the EEG or something like that, it would take quite a bit of training to, to, to distinguish all the different wiggles and, and say, well, these wiggles are just sort of not significant wiggles. And these wiggles on the other hand, indicate something important. Right. There's, I mean, you have a, you, you have a, you have an interesting example. Um, uh, you, you show a visual graph of two different sound waves, one of which has a tone with noise and one of which is just noise that visually look identical. And yet when you hear them, you can tell immediately the difference between those two, um, those two samples. Yeah. That was an example from Rick Heller, our colleague here. Yes, my friend, um, colleague. And so, so that yeah. somehow that the ear is attuned, can pick out signal from noise in a way that it's much harder for the eye to do or even data right. analysis. 
yeah, some of those th those kinds of patterns, which which um, which the ear can hear uh, in different ways, and they're patterns in time. I think that's the crucial thing, as opposed to visual um, visual patterns in space. It, you still there? We're just getting a little bit of a slow connection, I think, here. Oh yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Okay. Um, so let me let me um, sort of ask one last kind of framing question here, and then I think we may have some questions from the audience that we should take. Um, I'm struck at one thing, which is, in a sense, you you mentioned the body being opaque visually. And yet it's very transparent to sound. And there's a there's a theme that kind of flows through the book of sound having an impact on the body, you know, a deep, profound emotional impact, um, you know, causing these crisis states, or you know, that 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 ultrasound can pass through the body and be used, or can reflect off the body and be used, and that the body can produce sound or the sound, it can be audified into the, you know, recordings of the nerve or the brain. Um, and so there's something about the, there's something about sound in the body, the human body, that is a powerful resonant interaction in a way that perhaps doesn't happen visually. And I think there's maybe a, a through line of your, of your book. And I wondered if that captures yeah, an essence of this. Process. I was really startled to find out that the ear, and this is something that was discovered by a physicist, uh, the ear not only receives sound, but produces it. And that's right. the basis of the test that's done now on all infants just after a few minutes after birth, a passage with which their little probes put in their ear and they hear things and the way in which the ear sends sounds out is another way of indicating that the body is sounding, sounding in ways that weren't anticipated even even 40 or 50 years ago, people didn't realize those aspects of it. And ultrasound in particular, which is a, a very large part of my book, has turned out to be so powerful as an intervention because it compared to x-rays or any kind of um, technology based on electromagnetic radiation, it's far, far less um, invasive and dangerous. Um, right. Although it's, it has enough power that recently I had cataract surgery and my lens, of the, my old lens was dissolved through ultrasound. You know, like a little tiny pulse of ultrasound was enough to <laughs> blast it out. You know, just like in a second, I realized like, that's amazing. So the- Well, you did, you did point out that some early uh, researchers in ultrasound managed to kill a bunch of fish. I think you yes, said that, Yes, yes, right? yes, yeah. that's right, uh, unfortunately. Um, so there are a couple of questions that have, that have started to come up. So why don't we open this up to, so um, questions. So one, uh, one. I don't know, Peter. Can you open the Q and A there? You may be able to see them too. Oh, let me see under. Oh, I so, see. So um, Peter Cariani says before Hubel and, and Wiesel, uh, neurophysiologists were listening to neural phase locking for acoustic stimuli in the 1930s, cochlear microphonic through their electrodes. The telephone theory of neural temporal coding, and actually that's discussed in the book. Um, I believe, um, and and actually suggests here music as, as an effective stimulus for so many things because it impresses its time structure on the firing of neurons across the brain. Mm. It weakly mimics the codes that the brain uses for perception, emotion, action, such that it can induce a wide, wide variety of mental states. Time is of the essence. There is something about music, right, that has a has a very powerful, profound impact there. That's a wonderful observation, and I actually wasn't aware of that that work of Rutherford. So I'm very grateful to to learn about that. I think I think the comment that's, that 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 uh, Cariani puts forward that time is of the essence is exactly what I've been trying to say in this. And music music somehow directs us to it in a way. Um, I mean, it goes back to the the the. the to the Hippocratic idea of the crisis that, or of the experiment, that one of the Hippocratic maxims is that experiment is per perilous. Experimentum peri, you know, the, the trial is perilous. And that means that the crisis or the trial, I guess even the trial of the disease, um, the moment, the critical moment in its course is a moment that happens in time and has all the force and, uh, and power of a, of a musical and dramatic event. 
So another question that um, comes up here, could you tell a bit about your research process for the book and has your relationship to listening to music changed through writing this book and through the research? You must have, you certainly stumbled across some obscure um, musical compositions while you were <laughs> pursuing oh, this yes. research. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And, my, and the process of my research was very kind of haphazard. I mean, only a few years ago, I wouldn't have dreamed that I could do this. It was partly Professor Holton's question that made me start thinking like, well, you know, what about that? And so I began kind of meandering. It was a kind of slow meandering process. And often in the footnotes, I would find references to odd things like this the symphony by uh, uh, Gaetano Brunetti that I talk about in the book that was the, the first description of the obsessive called Il Maniatico, a symphony of, I think, 1791. And I'd never heard of the composer and certainly never heard the symphony. But when I heard it, I thought, I thought it was really an amazing piece of music. And the one thing for me, one thing led to another, and I certainly don't feel by any means that I've exhausted the subject, but somehow did 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 what I could also somehow trying always to press myself to find out what kind of an understanding was this. I guess that might be the the thing that happened to me most during this is that I would find all these curious examples. And that was the kind of wonderful and easy part because you'd realize that's just like her Her I'd never heard of. Him. Yes, right. I know any number yeah. of very, very well educated physicians who are interested in the history of medicine even who for whom this was a new name and so the idea that there was this person and who's the first person to train a woman in medicine uh the first person to i mean just really an amazing uh, person in anatomical discoveries that to me was one of the great joys is that i was finding people that i don't know i'd never known about before and also that challenged me to try to think about what does it mean to try to understand this this whole subject what kind mm -hmm. of because I find, and this is the way in which my own process or the way of thinking has been most molded by this, what understanding mean changes over time. What does it mean to understand something? What does it mean to hear something and say, oh, now I understand because of hearing a certain kind of a sound that gives you a kind of a thrill or, or, or a start, and then trying to understand, trying to articulate what what kind of an understanding was that? I still feel that we haven't, we're only at the beginning of that journey. Certainly I am. Yeah, I think you've mentioned this symphony by Brunetti several times. I, it's it's worth maybe giving just a tiny description of this. So this is this sort of illustration of what today we would call obsessive compulsive disorder. It has a solo cello yeah. that plays this little dee 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 figure. And, and in the style that you would have at the time, it's almost in in combat with the orchestra, the rest of the orchestra trying to fight against it. And then the orchestra then gets sort of sucked into it and starts playing that figure by the end of the whole um, right. thing. It's quite, it's quite an extraordinary, and and you can see how in a way, this is a musical rendition of obsessive compulsive, um, uh, you know, uh, mania, it was called at the time, um, that might be far more compelling and insightful in some sense than a, a verbal textual description. Yes, of this. because this, there's this kind of social element that the, the, the maniatico, the maniac, the obsessive compulsive yeah. cello is embedded in an orchestra. The orchestra sometimes is annoyed with him, sometimes tries to humor him, sometimes tries to cheer him up, and then he appears to be cheered up. Then he relapses back into his kind of <laughs> depressive state. And the orchestra at a certain point is sort of kind of, is just like so furious with him. But then at a certain point, it starts playing along. I don't know. Yeah. I, that was sort of something that I don't think had been noticed by other people. They had his his program. He writes a program for it says, oh, you know, finally, he's swept away by all the agreeable ideas that the orchestra presents to him. But I think it's actually a little bit more like one of those Spanish dramas or Don Quixote in which yeah, the yeah. Whole world is revealed as being obsessive. As, compulsive. Obsessive, right. Yeah. And the more so you let me... into that style, the more you realize that classical music is rather obsessive. So let me turn to a couple of these other questions here. Um, uh, any musicians today that you feel are especially attuned to or informed by these biological connections to rhythm and music? I Well, there's a famous, Alvin Lussier, famous uh, avant-garde composer, sonified his brainwaves and made them play <laughs> 
play percussion instruments. And so there's, what is it called? Composition number one. So there are musicians that are, you know, have long, you know, this was back in the sixties, it seems to me that he started to do this, <coughs> tried to do this. I'm, and then there's a tremendous amount of music that's influenced by, a, has a kind of therapeutic. Uh, right, uh, right. By therapeutic. And, and, and as you point out, the, the, Although you touch on that in a couple of places, that's actually mostly omitted from your from your book. Um, the idea yeah, of music as, as therapy, that's... because it's been well covered elsewhere. Um, someone asked here, any stories or tidbits that you uncovered that ended up on the cutting room floor, but that you could share with us now? Um, I would have to think about that. I'm trying to, I mean, most of the best ones I put in the book. I think I, I, I have to say, I, I have to say, having read it, there are a lot of fascinating stories and tidbits that all made it into the book. So there. Um, uh, one that I thought was really wonderful that I was mentioning a little that Herophilus was the first person to train a woman in medicine. And yeah. it's not clear whether he knew she must have come to him dressed as a man, and, or maybe she didn't, or maybe he, he, so little has remained in the historical record about this particular incident. At any rate, she went on to practice medicine in Athens and specialized in obstetrics. But then she was hauled in front of the court as on accusations of, of abusing her patients uh, you know, sexual harassment, and which is a sort of very modern kind of turn. Then she revealed herself to be a woman, and at her, her patients were then testified in front of the court. And the court was so amazed um, by this and so struck by how well she had done that they decreed that henceforth freeborn Athenian women could practice medicine, which is, you know, this is. Um, I mean, this is a long, long time ago, and it seemed to me a, a corner of medical or of history or also the history of the genders, which I was totally unaware of and struck me as kind of an amazing thing. Yeah, that's an amazing story. Um, uh, one last question. You mentioned that stethoscopes are out of fashion for modern doctors um, in favor of more quantitative methods. Do you think hearing lends itself to a more artful, qualitative understanding of the body in a way that sight does not? Perhaps, although I think most people find it very hard to describe sounds, um, and they have to, uh, they they almost kind of tend to fall back on analogy in the way that uh, Lenek had to talk about bellows sound or the sound of a little bell. On the other hand, a visual image, because it doesn't have a dramatic center in the same way that a sound does, may I think I'm tempted to agree with with Will Thompson's question and to think that maybe it's actually easier to describe sounds because of their dramatic impact uh, being focused in time and, and, and generated in time by a kind of stimulus that then has a kind of dramatic force that lends itself to an easier kind of description. Right, I mean, it's true that sound sort of can only exist over time as opposed to an image which can be you can't you can't encounter a static sound in a sense right sound can only be experienced over time in that sense just for some context your story about herophilus so herophilus was around 300 bc right so that's a pretty <laughs> pretty amazing story for that um uh for for context of that time um so speaking of that i think we are nearly out of time um and um, any last thoughts, uh, Peter, that you ha that you had um, wanted to share with us? I would just like to give a shout out to my editor, Katie Helke, at, at people at MIT Press, who were just magnificent to work with and have, I mean, supported me now through seven books. It, I cannot think of another publisher that would do something like that or do it so beautifully and with such wonderful spirit. I, I might, this would not have been possible without them. I must thank them. And I'll point out that the book is is um, is beautifully produced with um, images, and also then online you can go and hear these sound examples, which really creates an, another uh, another element of enjoying this book. So thank you, Peter. And I hope that the digital edition a digital edition will be available soon. But yes, on the book's website, the sound examples are all available. Thank you both so much. This was really fascinating. It's um, it's been really interesting to listen to, um, especially coming from a position of knowing nothing about this. You both made it very sort of uh, approachable in a way that I appreciate. <laughs> um, so thanks again for being here, both of you. And of course, thanks to all of you out there for spending your evening you. with us.
Um, please check out soundingbodiesonharvard.com. I've dropped the link in the chat a couple of times. Um, and you can, yeah, you can also uh, order a copy by calling the store um, at 617-661-1515. Um, Thanks again. Uh, on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, all here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, enjoy the rest of your evening. Keep reading, keep learning, and be well. Thank you. Thank you, Serena. Thank you, Logan. Thank you. Thanks, Peter.